Okay, um, thanks everybody for coming um, to see Ben Grosser. Um, his talk, entitled Hide the Metrics and Scare the NSA Met Art as Artistic Research, is part of our um, Spring Digital Arts and Culture series, um, also made possible uh, by the Negotiating Digital Culture series, funded by the Leslie Whitaker Memorial Award. This is actually the second uh, meeting that we're having, the third meeting, which everybody here is invited to, the second Negotiating Digital Culture um, conversation. It will be on April 14th at 4 p.m. here, and we're going to talk about what went on here today and other um, come up with other schemes for um, uh, creating engaging activities. Um, if you haven't signed in or signed this piece of paper, uh, Chris is coming around with something, or just holler. We want to get people to sign in. Also, if you're, I know Marissa is a student, but if anybody else is a student, who I promise extra credit for coming, say hey to me. Um, so let me introduce, um, let me just give you a, a basic, over, I mean, thank you for the basic overview also, but part of this is Ben's going to show us some things, and then he's going to ask us to participate, to brainstorm, to do something. And um, so that's the part uh, also that I'm excited about, is that there's uh, something hands-on here. So let me introduce artist Ben Grosser. Uh, he creates interactive experiences, machines, and systems that explore the cultural, social, and political implications of software. Uh, ben teaches in new media at um, the School of Art and Design at University of Illinois at Ch Champaign-Urbana. Um, Slate called his work Civil Disobedience in the Digital Age. Ben is most proud of his recent award uh, winning first prize in Vita 16, the uh, international award that recognizes works investigating art and artificial life. Um, without further ado, artist Ben Grosser. Thanks. So thanks for having me. Uh, my voice is a little, you know, it's the longest winter ever, except for the last winter, which seemed like the longest winter ever, but so a little bit uh, hoarse. Um, so I want to talk about two projects. So basically I'm going to talk about two net art projects of mine, and then um, that, uh, that kind of demonstrate some of the strategies that I use, uh, both as kind of artistic work, but also as, as, as research, as scholarly research. And then I'll shift and I will we'll do the workshop part where I'll ask you to do some brainstorming for some um, manipulations uh, of websites through browser manipulations. And I'll try and prototype a few of your ideas in real time so we can kind of see what they would do. I don't know how well that will go, but I think it will work. Um, and I should say that when, I'm, when, I, when I say net art, it's, it's a big topic. I don't mean to suggest that net art could be defined so simply as here's a couple projects and now you know what net art is. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of my projects that fit within that category pretty well. They, um, for me, tend to, to, to work in this realm of uh, browser-based manipulations of existing websites and systems. And the first one I want to talk about, um, I'll launch by kind of talking about uh, this scene from Oliver Stone's sequel to Wall Street called Wall Street Money Never Sleeps, where the uh, young trader Jake Moore is listening to the all-knowing CEO, Bretton James, and, and the young trader asks him, to, asks him a question. He says, what's your number? The amount of money it would take to be able to walk away from it all and just live happily ever after. See, I find that everybody has a number, and it's usually an exact number. So what is yours? And the CEO pauses for effect and delivers a one-word response. More. And I think this is illustrative of our capitalism-inspired you know, approach to everything these days. We see numbers, we want them to be bigger. In his case, it's money. But so much of, with so much of our interaction moving online, I think it's now starting to include things like how many friends do we have? Or how many likes did we get? Or how many times with our items shared, how many people commented on our photo. And as an artist, my research is on the social, cultural, and political implications of software. And so when I use a piece of software, I ask myself, 
why is it working this way? Or how might it be affecting me in addition to just using it? And, and with Facebook, I found myself, I did find myself, but when thinking about this piece, I found myself continually thinking about these questions of why am I obsessed with these numbers? You know, um, why do I care more about how much people like my status than who liked it? Or how many comments they left rather than what they wrote? And these quantifications or metrics as I refer to them are everywhere in Facebook. So here's a screenshot of my news feed, and I've circled in red all of these metric locations. These are the numbers that count the things you expect, like shares, comments, but also how many notifications you have, how many people are waiting to chat with you right now, how many seconds ago something happened, how many events you could go to, how many groups you have, how many, it goes on and on. And my approach is to examine these metrics from a software studies perspective, looking for the ways these numbers are determining what Matthew Fuller would refer to as the conditions of possibility. In other words, how are these numbers, these metrics operating on us as usual and constructing the ways we interact with the system? I want to go back and talk a little bit about this desire for more that I referred to. When faced with a number, why do we want it to be bigger? Why not smaller? Why why would, why would I want less likes? Why do I want more likes? And I would argue that the answer lies at the relationship between our evolutionarily developed need for personal worth and the pervasiveness of capitalism. So if we consider, as Marx would say, that capital has resolved personal worth into exchange value, then I would, for our purposes here today, reverse that equation. Exchange value is equal to personal worth. Personal worth is an essential human need. Um, it would fall under Maslow's hierarchy um, as uh, um, yeah, connectedness. And, and one that, it's one that can only be fulfilled within a capitalist system, because Mark Fisher tells us like we can't really imagine anything outside of that system anymore. And capital creates a system of equivalence between cultural objects that promotes free trade as our sole freedom, right? That's how we get to have agency now. So when these two are tied together, personal worth and capitalism, it stands the reason that we become subject to an inherent desire for more, a state of being where more exchange, more value, and more personal worth, or more, personal, more trade equals more personal worth. So how does this play out in Facebook? So I would contend that all these metrics are working to increase user engagement on the site, um, sometimes producing highly reactive patterns of behavior, and in the process, they start to prescribe certain kinds of social interactions. For example, when I'm constantly told how many friends I have and how many friends my friends have, how does that start to change my desire to have more friends? In fact, Facebook literally adds a plus one to the add friend button. So this I'm incrementing my social capital by one every time I just get another one on the list. When I'm showed how many likes my status got, how does that change what I write in the status box in the first place? Some of you who use Facebook maybe could probably tell me, I know if I post a photo of my cat, it's going to get more likes than if I kind of am sincere about something that's really hard in my life right now, right? Well, so which are you going to post? Um, so in other words, this desire for more, more likes starts to change what we write in the system. When I'm told that 17,772 people like this ad from appycouple.com, <laughs> how does that change the likelihood that I might also like it when I see it? Now, I also think of the timestamps as metrics. These are the hyper-specific age counts of every piece of content in the system. I don't really need to know that my friend had her banana 29 seconds ago versus 48 seconds ago. This is a distinction that doesn't matter to me. But the way the system, the interface is, is created and presents that information suggests it should be. You know, it suggests that I should be constantly focused on this and I might miss something. What if I wasn't there between 29 and 48? So it keeps us coming back and focused on the system. So all these numbers play into the growth fetish of capitalism fueling competition between users to get more likes than someone else. They can make us anxious as we wait for more likes or as we look for quantitative evidence of acknowledgement from others, as everything gets old right before our eyes. 
and the numbers compel Facebook's users to reimagine both self and friendship in quantitative terms, right? So the, the visibility of these numbers, these metrics of social performance across one social network situates those users in what I would coin as a graph opticon or a form of self-induced audit within social networks where the many watch the metrics of the many and thus internalize a need to excel in metric terms. And so, through these metrics, Facebook becomes a technology of control. It's driving how we act in the system, it's changing what we write, and it guides our behavior and how we interact with our friends. And, you know, as an, you know that, that's kind of like my theoretical analysis of how some of these numbers are working. As an artist, what I do is I make things. And so I decided to make something to work with this, and so I created a, a work I call Facebook Demetricator. <coughs> And it's a free and open source browser extension that just takes all the numbers away. No longer do you see um, how many people liked your thing or how much they liked your status. And you get a toggle in the, is this, I mean, yeah, you get a little toggle. So you can turn it on and off, but by default it's on, hiding the numbers all the time. So on the top you can see Typical like, share, comment box on the bottom is what it looks like with Demetricator installed. Instead of 56 people like this, it just says people like this. It just says it was shared or that there are comments. But you don't know how many. It's not foregrounding that quantitative aspect. Same with friends. I know I have friends. I could count them up if I wanted to count up 562 friends. Um, but it's not foregrounding that. It even gets rid of that plus one, so the add friend button isn't always suggesting that this is the way to get more. Same with the ads. I know people like the ad, but it could be one, it could be 17,000. And also the timestamp. So a timestamp like six seconds, I don't, I don't remove these. What I do is I alter them. So six seconds becomes recently. And something a little bit older becomes a while ago. So those are the two categories in time now that you use dementia care should recently or a while ago. And so with this product, I, would, I, I aim to ease what I would prefer what I refer to as the prescribed sociality these metrics are producing. And it does this by just taking them out of the equation altogether. Once they're gone, all of a sudden you notice their absence and you start to maybe get a sense of how they were acting upon you as a user. And the software's been out there for a couple of years now. It's been used by a lot of people. Um, tens of thousands of people have used it over the last couple of years. And I get a lot of feedback, both in terms of um, you know, direct email, but also I can read comments and articles on those kinds of things. And I just want to briefly touch on some of this. First of all, I should point out that a lot of people just don't see the point at all. Why would you want to get rid of the numbers on Facebook, this person said, but that's the whole reason for Facebook, to ring up the experience points. The students might be able to identify with this as well, right? It's useful to strive to maximize numerical success. It's how SATs and many careers work. It's just another part of learning how to operate in a capitalist society, right? Why would we get rid of it? And a prominent blogger wrote me and said, yeah, but those of us with good metrics want to show them. We don't want to hide them. I've got a lot of likes, a lot of followers, so. It also removes reactive behavior. So this person said the notifications become like meth. That all changed when I downloaded the add-on. Or my flocking to Facebook's little red notification number is akin to a mouse pressing a lever for heroin. So I wonder, how many Facebook users are there even in the room? I guess I should ask. Okay, so when you first log on to Facebook, where do you look? on the interface. Notifications. At the notifications, right? It's the first place that you, is that what you're going to say? So I look at recent posts. Ah, okay, right. But do you still look at notifications just in case? I don't need to. Okay, well, um, generally people will say the notifications, right? It's like, you wonder, did anybody acknowledge my presence while I was gone? Did somebody respond to the thing that I did, that I, you know, that I posted? And you click on it, um, if you have some, maybe get a little jolt of excitement, right? Like, oh, so there's something new. You click on it, you see what it was. Probably isn't that interesting. Uh, maybe it is. I don't know. 
And, and then you, you know, to get it to come back, you generate more content for the system, and then you get more notifications. Or if you log on and there isn't any notifications to see, maybe you have a little moment of disappointment. Um, and you kind of wish, oh, nobody paid attention to me. How could I change that? What could I post that would get some reactions? It also blunts feelings of competition. So some person, one person said it's so much more enjoyable without that constant pressure to compare. Can any, would anybody admit to wondering why somebody else's photo got more likes than yours? Or, you know, right? I mean, I do this. Um, like, well, my photo's better than that. Or, you know, my status was more witty than that other person's status. Why did they get 35 likes or whatever it was? Also, calms, uh, makes people calm. It's from the minimalism subreddit. Um, helps you stop worrying about how many liked your shit. But it also, the most interesting category of feedback I've received is that it relaxes self-imposed rules. So it turns out that users create rules for themselves about how to act and interact within Facebook based on what the numbers say. So I'll give you a few examples. The first one is around how many likes something has. When somebody uses Demetrica, I've had people tell me now they don't know if they can like anything because it turns out they've made a rule for themselves that if it has, say, more than 25 likes, then they don't, they don't, give, they don't like anything with more than 25 likes because that person's got enough, <laughs> right? Like, why would I waste my like? As if there's, like, a finite you know, number of likes you have to, to give. But the converse is also true. People have told me, well, I don't know if I can like something because what if I was that first, like, out on the limb liker but nobody else follows me and, and now I'm, like, the only one who liked this thing. At the same time, the timestamps work in a similar way. So um, it turns out that people have made rules for themselves that they don't like anything if it's older than, say, two days. That's old news. You know, why would I dredge something up from the past and something Facebook's algorithm decides to put something on the feed and I don't know how old it is and all of a sudden I'm liking something from like last week as if that's ancient history. Um, so in other words, these users are like, literally some people have written me that they don't know what to do anymore in the face of not having the numbers. In fact, getting rid of the timestamp to metrication is the most requested email I get. People are like, I like this, but could you just get rid of the timestamp? thing. Just let me see the timestamps. So in all these cases, Demetricator is relieving these users of interaction patterns, but it's also served to reveal the existence of those patterns in the first place. This is how we can find out that they exist. And so I think of, of Demetricator as a, it's certainly, it, first and foremost for me, it's a work of art, um, but it's also a piece of critical software um, that ideally hopes to both reveal these how these things are working, but also to ease these aspects of prescribed sociality that constant quantification imposes. And I just want to mention, if this, is, if this is of interest to you, I recently published an article in the journal Computational Culture where I go into great depth into kind of my theoretical basis for this and a lot more about um, the feedback and kind of this idea of the graph opticon and, and, and all these things. So um, plenty more to get at if you're interested. So one other project I want to share. I'll start this one with a movie, too. This is a screenshot from The Truman Show. And about a quarter of the way into the movie, Truman's love interest, Sylvia, um, manages to get Truman isolated on the beach. How many people have seen The Truman Show? OK, so most people, if, in case you aren't aware, The Truman Show is about a, a guy who's lived his whole life as the star of a reality television show he didn't realize he was a part of. And Sylvia gets them isolated on the beach and for a few minutes. And she knows they're being watched, so it's not going to last long. But she has them for a moment where they're kind of like outside of the ability of anyone to intervene. And so she says something to them. She says, everybody knows everything you do. Everybody's watching you. They're watching us right now. And this is a key moment in the film when Truman starts to realize that maybe some of these weird things he's noticed add up to something. You know, eventually leads him to discover that his whole life has been the star of this TV show that he didn't know about, and everybody's acting all around him. And even though U.S. citizens have had their own suspicions about how we're being surveilled um, ever since 9-11, um, it took the revelations from Edward Snowden for us to really get a handle 
on how widespread that really was and is now. Um, you know, in effect, we've all become subjects of the NSA's reality TV show. They're watching us right now, and they know what we do. In fact, they'll even have this video to watch. Um, and artists have long engaged the politics of surveillance using techniques such as hacktivism and tactical media. As you can imagine, these have picked up since the Snowden revelations. This is a piece by Julian Oliver called Glasshole.sh. It's a script that kicks all Google Glass um, off of any network uh, so that if you're trying to, if you're wearing Google Glass, you can kind of make Google Glass free zones so you aren't subject to the surveillance when you can't know it's happening. Amelia Marzek's signal strength creates a dark net, a, a completely isolated internet for kind of you know, communication amongst individuals but without it being part of the larger internet. Leo Salvaggio's You Are Me project, he offers his own face as a mask for anybody to wear anywhere to evade or to fool face detection systems. <laughs> And so, you know, these are strong and clever artistic approaches to government surveillance. And they're trying to preserve some degree of privacy um, in a world where privacy is not very common anymore. And I certainly understand their strategy of hiding from surveillance because the NSA isn't just trying to read your email or trying to listen to your phone call. Just like on the Truman Show, they want to read everything. And so this is a slide from the Snowden Archive, and it's this bubble right here I'm most interested in called Collect It All. This is their, this is their strategy. This is the ideology of the NSA. They want everything from everybody. They don't just want some. They want everything. And the tool that enables them to do this surveillance, to collect everything, is software. And so what I'm really talking about is the relationship between software and privacy. And um, I probably don't need to tell this audience, but you know, Bentham showed that when we think we're being watched, it changes what we do. Um, and so I became interested once the Snowden revelations came out as to how might all this surveillance and our knowledge of it be changing what we do online. And in particular, in this project, the material I'm focused on is email. And one of the strategies that the NSA uses in email surveillance is the automated detection of predetermined keywords that they have decided suggest nefarious intent or might be from presumed terrorists, for example. And I don't know exactly what words they use because Snowden hasn't leaked it, or at least Glenn Greenwald hasn't reported on it. But I can make some guesses. I mean, you could probably make some guesses already. Um, but this is a document that was FOIA. It came out as a Department of Homeland Security um, analyst binder for somebody who was tasked with monitoring social media to watch for suggestions of something bad about to happen. And it's got a list of words they should watch for, and it's pretty enlightening. So these are the things. Like, it's got these words you would expect. It's got Al-Qaeda on it. It's got Dirty Bomb on it. It's got Iran or whatever. It's got you know, Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq, etc. But what's interesting are the words I didn't expect. Facility, plot, power, bridge. And one of the things that happens with this automated keyword searching is that large collections of words are becoming codified as something to fear, as indicators of intent. And I would argue the result is a government surveillance machine run amok, algorithmically collecting and searching our digital communications in an attempt to, in a futile attempt to predict behavior by presumed terrorists based on what they find in your email. So my artistic response to this is a work that I call ScareMail. ScareMail is a free and open source browser extension that makes email scary in an attempt to disrupt NSA surveillance. It extends Google's Gmail and it adds to every email signature an algorithmically generated narrative that contains all kinds of words from this scary word list. And to create these narratives, I start with uh, an original source text. In my case, I use Ray Bradbury's 451. And I use natural language processing to identify all the nouns and verbs. And I swap most of them out with words from this Homeland Security list, properly conjugated, formatted, etc. And I end up with a version of Fahrenheit 451, actually 10 versions, that are all filled with these scary words like power and bridge and al-Qaeda and Iran. Um, and then every time you send an email, if you use this software, 
it generates a at that moment a unique kind of Markov chain version um, of text that goes at the bottom of your email. So I'll read this one to you so you can get a sense of it. <clears throat> Captain Beatty failed on his Al Shabab, hacking restlessly about the fact to fish this far and strand her group on the wall to wall in calling suspicious packages. And in this empty cloud with a peaceful man on one long sickening person of power. He recalled his agent and the orange grid scam with its child and his woman tonight, with the Coast Guard to the dark place, for which he told the problem of the great government of fairy earthquakes. His domestic nuclear detections felt like a securing a tsunami warning center like me, if you gang us again. We looted a fact to see the time after time. So in other words, these are plausible ish narratives. I mean, they're not good, right? But if I'm an NSA surveillance algorithm tasked with finding certain words, and even if that gets passed to a human, I may have to take a minute and make sure this isn't something I should be focused on. And so scare mail stories thus act as traps for NSA programs like Prism and X Key Score, um, forcing them to look at algorithmically generated nonsense. And each story is unique in an attempt to avoid automated filtering by the NSA. This also has gotten a lot of press, um, so I've been able to kind of see what a variety of different types of people think about it. Um, some people are just, I mean, some people are like those people like, yes, something I can fight back at the NSA. So some Twitter users love this idea. Scare mail makes email scary, distracts, confuses NSA surveillance. Or give the government something to read. Use scare mail. Um, the Atlantic picked up on the counterintuitive nature of the project, uh, calling it the art project that wants the NSA to read your email. Fast Company speculated about the consequences of if you were to download scare mail and use it yourself, um, with the tagline, but don't blame us when the feds knock on your door. And this, this, there's this, you know, there's a whole trend in this direction as well. This person said, hilarious, until they actually come to arrest you, or worse, just take you for a ride. Um, referring to me as the artist, someone said, he just made it onto the no-fly list, congratulations. Um, <clears throat> but I should also acknowledge, down here at the bottom, that there's a lot of people who just think I'm thwarting the United States' efforts to combat terrorism. So, for example, it's not funny and it's not cool. These immature knobs are deciding on our behalf that they would prefer their families to be bombed instead of the government knowing what they browse. By far the most high-profile um, publication to jump on this way of thinking about it was the Sunday Opinion page of the Chicago Tribune, um, very concerned about its potential, where they literally equated the use of scare mail saying it threat, it's the same, threatens to have the same effect as outing undercover agents or selling plastic guns that can evade metal detectors. And I think these negative responses are particularly interesting because all scale, which scare mail does is it adds words to the ends of emails. Yet doing so produces this huge reaction of people believing that using scare mail is similar to a terrorist act. And even supporters of the project, people who are like, yes, scare mail is awesome, I love it, I love what you're doing, they don't want to use it either, right? Because they know that it might increase the chances they'll be surveilled. And you know, Domesticator, as I said, it's like tens of thousands of users. Scare mail's had equal amounts of press, Guardian, Der Spiegel, Atlantic, it's like 500 users, right? People don't want to use scare mail. Only the really hardcore people are willing to try it out. So, my point here is that clearly computational surveillance affects what we do online. And the ability to use whatever words we want is one of our most basic freedoms, yet NSA surveillance of electronic speech threatens these rights. Um, and it also reveals one of the primary flaws in the NSA surveillance efforts, which is that words do not necessarily equal intent. And it also draws attention to a problem with their ideology of collect it all. So in the run-up to 9-11, it's commonly known at this point that the government had everything it, knew, it needed to discern that the, the, the you know, terrorist attack was going to happen. But they already had so much information, they couldn't find the right bits of it. And so their reaction ever since is to make their haystacks way, way bigger. 
And the Boston Marathon bombing is a good example. You know, we were, the Russian government was telling us, hey, um, watch out for these guys. They've got, they've got, um, they're up to no good. And we, there's, there's too much to, to pay attention to for the NSA already. In fact, recently, was it was like a couple weeks ago now, finally been like leaked out of the NSA that before the Snowden revelations that um, it turns out they had come to that same conclusion that maybe this isn't worth it. I read this just a week or two ago. But as soon as the Snowden revelations came out, they decided they weren't going to tell anybody about that. And so the world's primary response to this collected all ideology is to use encryption. Um, in other words, to hide from surveillance. And it's certainly an understandable response, but it's a symmetrical response, one that tries to compete with the NSA on its own turf. And so with Scaramelli, I use a different strategy, one that Alexander Galloway would refer to as an exploit, or an asymmetric response to the ubiquity of network state power. I can't compete with the NSA's ability to crack encryption, but I can use their desire to collect everything against them. In other words, I give their search algorithms just what they want, more scary words. And if every email contains the scary words they're looking for, then searching for those words becomes a fruitless exercise because the search that returns everything is research that returns nothing of use. And so with Scaremail, I propose an alternative model of privacy, essentially. It's a conceptual model, understand, admittedly, um, a model of privacy built on visibility and noise rather than encryption and silence. Um, so that kind of ends with the presentation of these two works. Um, since the time is going fine, maybe I should pause for the moment and see if you have any questions about those two works. And if you do, I'll answer them. And if not, we can move into the workshop part. Any questions? Yeah. Have you tested whether you've been able to fly yet or not? I have. <laughs> Although I will say that I kind of was wary of it, and I didn't fly for a while in response. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, truthfully, I had a lot of fear around it. Um, I came up with the idea almost the same week that Snowden leaked. The Snowden stuff started in June of 2013, but um, I was like, oh, God, do I really want to do that, you know? And then a call from IB came out for surveillance-related works. So I was like, okay, this is, at least if I'm in an exhibition of surveillance-related work, I'll give you a little bit of cover as an artist. Um, and so that's when I did it a few months later. Hi, my name is Amanda Sullivan, I teach history and urban studies. Um, my question is about the geometric hater. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can tell there's so many what you say because I remember a time when I was sitting next to my 20, my sister who's a generation younger than I am, who was looking at um, her Facebook page and she, I could see her ignoring those red notifications and I was like, what, but don't we need to go check who these people are? Who are so I know there's, there's something there, but, but, but I, there's also a countervailing channel. I just wanted to hear what you think about it. Yeah. People who very intentionally trim their their list, and they say, I'm getting rid of people who I'm not close friends with. Yeah. Or, you know, if you want to stay on my list, let me know. How do you think about that it, it, with respect to your thesis that we're all about growth? Yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're always going to be the people who are kind of not going along with the flow that the interface suggests. Um, and I guess my response would be that, in a way, they're still focused on the quantifications. Often when I hear people talk about trimming their lists, it's like, I have too many. I, I want to get under X amount or something like that. Um, often it's because there's too much activity in their feed or, or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's a good point. You know, not everybody, uh, not every single human is going to react this way. I think it's just a general trend. Um, you know, the self, the quantified self movement is a good example. A lot of people are, you know, want to strap on a Fitbit or use the health tracker on their phone and track every step and track everything. But not everybody feels like that's the thing for them. But I, I would argue that in general, where we become predisposed, not only through interfaces like Facebook, really more so through, say, audit culture, um, you know, the fact that we're measured as students based on tests and these kinds of things right from the beginning. Um, we're always told we should excel in quantitative terms. Um, those metrics determine how we, what, what paths we have through life, these kinds of things. Um, this is part of what makes most people susceptible to it. Um, 
I was wondering if you've had any new thoughts about some of this work, like since over the last like couple months, like free free speech or freedom of speech is really changing, like with the protest and everything. I'm even thinking about like um, how much the protest is about like everyone watching um, the the government or the or the cops or the police forces, mm -hmm. and or even like the work that you talked about about the facial recognition. Stuff, which again is about hiding, but the protests are like the opposite. Like you're saying, they're about like visibility and watching. And so I, it's just interesting to see how like all this stuff is happening. All your work is happening online, but it totally has a correspondence of what's happening, like with bodies. Too. Might might be a cool um, new project. Or yeah, yeah, it might be. That's a good. That's a good question. I mean, you know. Part of why I like that that URB project by Leo Salvaggio, it, it, it gives people, like, some people are afraid to get out in physical space and do a protest, for example, because they know they end up in a database. Um, and he kind of allows them to still have a face, but it's kind of this eternally confounding face for algorithms, because it's always going to be the same face. But yeah, it's a good, I'll have to think about it. Yeah. So. You know, Snowden in the NSA is one context, mm -hmm. but now we have this German co-pilot yeah. who it turns out was actively doing web searches on suicide methods and cockpit doors, so we read this morning. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure we're going to get a clamor now to surveil intensively all members of flight crew, you know, so that the corporation is now responsible for, because the Lufthansa is going to be legally responsible for not stopping this. Yeah. So now every airline is going to be responsible for every web search that its pilots, you know. How does that fit into your thinking? Yeah, um, it's a great, it's a great question. I know that I have a great answer, but so I mean, it's now it's not just this sort of almost mythically monolithic government surveilling us, but is that potentially? You know, other other kind of responsible entities. I mean, I, I would first, I guess, I would argue that we already are in that again yeah. in that state um, where corporations are in collusion with the NSA and it's all um, surveillance. But it's an interesting question. I guess my answer as a privacy, I, I, I guess, I think of myself as a privacy advocate, is that that's the price of privacy. You know, that we can't. You know, yes, we could we could have potentially stopped that one pilot from crashing that plane. Um, maybe, maybe not. If Lufthansa had been surveilling every keystroke that all of their pilots had entered. But the truth is, they may not have caught it. And even if they had, I don't think it's worth the loss. Uh, I don't think it's worth the loss of agency that everybody who participates in Lufthansa or any other corporation gets, especially when we live in a society that's almost entirely run by corporations.